Let me give you a scenario. You're traveling to your next quest, and there's a fork in the road. Both paths lead to your next objective. The path leading left says, Safe and instant fast travel. Please deposit 500 in-game coins or two real-world dollars to access. The path on your right says, Warning. Goblins, orcs, ogres, demons, and other unspeakable perils may interrupt this fast travel. Free to access. You're not really in the mood for another 20-minute wait-for-stamina bar to recharge while being chased simulator, so you look at your inventory. Curses. <laughs> you forgot you just spent the bulk of your coins buying rounds for the tavern and impressing the well-endowed wenches back at the last town. I just spent 2,000 coins? What did I just do? What happened? Did I just buy everyone a round? I thought I was skipping dialogue. Yeah, buy a round. And now you only have 400 coins. Not enough for fast travel. You now have a decision to make. Hoof it on the deliberately long road, embrace for the deliberately placed perils along the way, or save yourself the fight and or 20 minutes of walking, and just buy the fast travel. After all, your time on this earth is finite. Why waste 20 minutes of it traveling when you could just pay real money and arrive at your destination instantly? And this, dear viewer, is a kind of decision that we should never be asked to make. That scenario may not be exactly what we're experiencing right now, but it was inspired by what we're going to talk about today. But what's the problem with a player's freedom of choice in that scenario? Let's get into it. What I've described is an example of paying to progress. Pay to progress? Is that like pay to win? Well, not exactly. If the comments section of my Helldivers 2 live service review is any indication, a lot of people can't seem to agree on what it means for a game to be called pay to win. It's a football field with 72 different goalposts, apparently. So instead of debating whether or not you can win a game even if you're not competing with other players to do it, which you can, we're going to solely focus on progress instead. And this video is not here to create more tribalism in the gaming community, it's just to help people who don't understand what all the screeching is about understand where we're coming from. Progress in a video game is the difference between where you started when you booted it up for the first time and where you are now. Are you a level 10 fire mage instead of a level 0 peasant? That's progress! Have you finally you. made your way from the starting location to the tallest mountain in the game so you could see the whole landscape? Progress again. Do your Grand Theft Auto stats show that you've paid three million dollars in the club for dances instead of- Hey, turn that off, turn that off! Although progress can be indicative of winning, this is not always the case. If I'm a guy who's collected every hat in Red Dead 2, that doesn't mean I'm any closer to winning the game than someone else, but it does reflect the progress that I've made while I've been playing. How's it possible for someone to pay for something like that? You can't replace game play with game pay, can you? Ooh, 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 ooh. can you? Now, paying for progress is not a new concept in gaming. Mobile games like Candy Crush have been conning middle-aged mothers for decades. Clash of Clans, Clash Royale, take your pick. There's plenty of mobile games out there that sell you progress at every waking moment you're interacting with it. And it works! The mobile games industry has profits so high, it persuaded Blizzard to spit out the slot machine simulator that is Diablo Immortal, despite their fans literally telling them to their face that's not what they wanted. Hey, uh, just was wondering, is this uh, an out-of-season April Fool's joke? <laughs> Uh, but we're not middle-aged moms connecting colors or 10th graders upgrading their village in between classes, are we? No, we are cool gamers who play cool games. So how will paying to progress affect the games that we actually play? Well, it kinda already does. Games like Warframe or everyone's favorite YouTube sponsors World of Tanks and War Thunder already ask players to make the choice between playing the game for rewards and paying the game for rewards. And of course, there's the Battle Pass. A trail of progression that usually offers to let you either earn your way through or just pay to skip the levels instead. Depending on the game, some of these levels just offer cosmetics, but others can give you gameplay-altering rewards. Like new, maybe better characters or weapons, which again, you can earn faster if you pay your way up rather than play your way up. And I guess to answer the question of who cares if you can pay for everything in a game instead of playing it, there comes a point when a game is no longer a game to be played. 
When every line of code is asking you to pay more money, it becomes questionable whether or not the game actually wants to be played anymore. It's like a virtual store that's just going out of its way to try to get us to take the game out of the video game and just pay for the progress instead. The more successful they are with getting people to do this, the more frequently we see it. And I don't know about you, but I like it when I can actually play my video games. And there's already games out there that can be classified as more pay than it is play, but I haven't played every game in existence, so I'm not going to be able to list them all here today. In fact, you know what, if there's a game that you know of that you think has pay to progress in it, leave it down in the comments and spread the awareness to everybody else. How about we look at one game in particular that's gotten heaps of criticism lately and stirred up its own little hurricane of online debate. Capcom's 2024 release of Dragon's Dogma 2 was met with a hate storm of negative user reviews right out of the gates. Yes, a large part of this was due to the game's performance on PC, but the other side of this had nothing to do with the game's specs at all. It's a AAA game released after 2010, so you already know what it is. Microtransactions. Unlike the other sort of greedy Sith trash we usually see, Dragon's Dogma 2's microtransactions spark a way more interesting debate. If you look at this list of microtransactions, you're gonna notice a few things. One, they're all pretty cheap, relatively speaking. A couple dollars at most. Two, if you've played it, you might notice that these are all things you can also just earn by playing the game. These items can be enjoyed by both game players and game payers. And three, we're not just talking about cosmetic Barbie dress up here. These are items you can actually use in the game. You've got a camping kit, which allows you to set up camp in the game and recharge your party stats. You've got a currency that allows you to change your character's appearance. And you've got a currency that allows you to fast travel safely and immediately rather than having to pay for the ox cart that may or may not be interrupted by enemies on the road. Ox carts are safe means of traveling, their services are available at regular intervals. A few moments later. Whoa, that's a troll attacking us? Just keep driving. No, I think I gotta fight him. Oh, there's a skeleton too? Alright, alright, alright. Dude, remind me to never use the ox cart again. Now let's not get so hot and bothered by these purchases that we're not honest about them. I'll re-emphasize here, you can find these items, or at least still feel their effects, through gameplay. With the main three purchases we're focusing on today, the camping kit for resting, the port crystals for portable fast travel points, and the character appearance changers, we've got to remember that buying these does not mean you're paying for an exclusive experience. Instead, you're paying real money to skip the gameplay that would be required to experience them in the first place. You know, get that pesky gameplay out of my video game. Now what do these three features of the game have in common? Well, for one, they're all features that have historically existed in single player games completely free of charge. I can set up my camp to rest anywhere I want in Red Dead 2. I can change my character's appearance at any time in Ghost Recon Wildlands, even in the middle of a fight. And I can fast travel with almost no restrictions at all in Starfield. For better or for worse for that game. So why are these things for sale now? Well, let's not rewrite history here. Dragon's Dogma 2 is not the first time pay to progress has been offered in a single player game. Remember when Dead Space 3 got lambasted over selling better weapons and resources for upgrades? And this isn't Capcom's first rodeo with this either. Both the Devil May Cry and Resident Evil series have seen this sort of thing in the past, like Resident Evil 4's remake letting you buy weapon upgrades with real money. And I'm seeing a little bit of a whataboutism with this, like people saying that if you weren't mad about RE4 Remake doing it, then you can't be mad here. And you know what? If we wade through the spite and snark in that statement, there's a little bit of truth there. But just because someone didn't notice it in RE4 or didn't have a lot to say about it at the time, doesn't mean they're not allowed to voice their concerns now. I would hope they'd be consistent from this point on, but you know, sometimes it just takes repeat exposure for people to wake up and realize, yo, that money monster really wants my Steam wallet. Actually, you know what? Let's not hyperbolize it as a money monster. Let's just call it what it is. All together now, game studios are a business. To see the problems with this, we can't just think like gamers, we need to think like a business. But businesses wanting to make money isn't the main problem here. Let me show you what the problems actually are. 
The first red flag I notice when a game is offering pay to progress is limiting the player's use of something based on how much of a currency they have. In Dragon's Dogma 2, without a camping kit, you can't camp. Without one of the metamorphosis tomes, you can't change your appearance. You want to play around with the character creator in the middle of your playthrough and laugh at changing the chest size because you're seven? Uh, <laughs> I haven't looked at chat yet. Sorry, brother. No book, no bobs. And without the portable port crystals, you can't fast travel outside of predetermined locations. If you haven't already guessed, the fast travel in this game is what inspired that scenario at the beginning of the video. But don't hear me wrong. It's not always a simple case of currency bad. It makes perfect sense that I have to save up some gold coin before I can buy better armor. Experience itself is a currency, and you have to gain so much of that before you unlock new skills in just about every game ever. Currency on its own is not the problem. I'm not advocating that we should never have to work for anything that we get in the game. Sorry, Bernie. It's when a game tries to sell you an in-game currency so that you can use it on... something you should never feel like you have to pay real money for. Tell me, how is it a better experience for the player when they can't change the look of their character or fast travel without an in-game currency? Well, thinking like a gamer, I suppose it can be sometimes, depending on the game and if it's contributing to player immersion. Like yeah, it makes sense I can't just ride in this guy's cart if I don't have the money to pay him. It makes sense that I can't change my haircut without money to pay the barber. Currency just contributes to the believability and immersion of a world, right? Nah, stop it. You're thinking like a gamer. What does the business side of in-game currency have to say about it? Well, it's simple, really. Create the problem, sell the solution. And then you can buy the Art of Metamorphosis. Now, this is a premium item as well. You use this item and it will allow you to customize your appearance on your main character or your pawn. You can do it twice for free. And then unfortunately they've limited it so you pay for the microtransactions, which is a stupid discussion for another day. Well, today must be another day. Now since Dragon's Dogma 2 launched with only the two Art of Metamorphosis tomes available through gameplay, Capcom has since upped it to where you can get 99 of them in-game. Now, now, guys, come on. I'm sure updating the game to have 99 of them instead had nothing to do with player backlash or bad press. Come on, boy. Go get it. Come on. Nah, they knew what they were shipping out the door. When Capcom designed their game to limit character customization and offers that currency for sale to the player in exchange for real money, this was a business decision. Players who have already bought the game at full price, might I add. And this isn't a long-term live service game we're talking about here either. It's a single player game with a beginning, middle, and end. Buying these doesn't support ongoing development of anything. Outside of the immersion defense, another defense I see of it is, well, it helps people who don't have time to grind. Sometimes people just want to take shortcuts. This, my friends, is the classic Aesop fable of the sun and the wind. Instead of using force to remove the man's coat like the wind tried to do, when the sun wants to take the traveler's coat off of him, he just makes it hotter until the traveler wants to take it off all on his own. The Traveler then thinks it's his idea to take off his own coat and gladly does so. Defending paying to progress as being helpful is only looking at the selling the solution part. It completely ignores when a studio is the one turning up the heat in the first place. Like when a video sharing platform puts ads on every single video regardless of the creator's monetization status, then tries to sell you a premium subscription to bypass those ads. Stop me if you heard this one. But you can earn all the items by playing the game too. If you don't want it, just don't buy it. Hey, well with that one, congrats. Capcom agrees with you. That's the defense they used for themselves. But to accept this line of thinking, it requires one thing. One thing that I and many gamers like me simply do not have when it comes to modern gaming. Money. I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> it's trust. We don't have trust. For as long as paying to progress exists in gaming, we players will have to trust that a studio will forget the nature of business entirely, which is to grow its profit margin year over year. After all, bigger artificial problems will require bigger artificial solutions. 
Take fast travel for example. If fast traveling across a game's world is something that you can buy with real money, we would have to trust that a game will not deliberately make the journey on foot longer or more difficult to persuade us to just buy instant travel instead. I mean, why else would Dragon's Dogma 2 have two different ways of fast travel, one that's completely safe and one that has risks? Am I dead again? Alright, so I guess fast travel is just not an option. Can you guess which one they let you pay for? We have to trust that a studio won't arbitrarily increase the grind rate for items, armors, or skills just to persuade us to buy the progress instead. And it's not like this has never happened before. Square Enix did this in Marvel's Avengers when they nerfed XP, then added boosters to the store, and EA did this when they created absurdly long grind times for unlocking heroes in Battlefront 2, all in an attempt to promote buying loot boxes. Players correctly called out this game design that promotes paying to progress over playing to progress, so Square Enix removed the boosters and EA removed the loot boxes. Sure, EA got some heat from politicians, but that's not what got them to change it up. I mean, if it had been, EA wouldn't still be selling loot boxes in their sports games today. No, the votes that made Battlefront 2 a better game were gamers voting with their wallets, causing EA to lose 3.1 billion with a B worth of stock in the same month the game came out. And those loot boxes were earnable in-game then too, but didn't matter. Gamers were pissed and shareholders dipped. Good job, gamers. To understand the problem with unnecessary microtransactions that earn you the same things that you can earn through gameplay, you have to ask yourself, if these purchases are so unnecessary, why are they in the game at all? Well, this answer is simple too. They are there to test you. They want to see what they can get away with selling you and how far they can push it over time. If you want to see the long-term effects of exactly what I'm talking about, look at the Call of Duty series. I've got a video on exactly how corporate greed and player tolerance made this series the godforsaken thing it is today. As for us common folk and the idea of having to just trust a studio to have our best interest at heart. <laughs> Are you serious? Most of the time, we're never going to hear about conversations that happen behind closed doors or what factors led to different decisions in game design. We're not going to know for sure when distances between landmarks were unnecessarily increased just to sell us fast travel, when enemy difficulty was spiked just to sell us upgrades, or when in-game currency was made more rare to sell us bundles of it. It's complete blind faith that we as players would have to have, and I don't know about you, but I choose for the ball to be in our courts as players every time. Now, Dragon's Dogma 2 is far from the most egregious example in gaming today, but it is in the spotlight right now, and the profits that Capcom bring on these microtransactions, despite the outcry about them, will absolutely be a factor in the way that Capcom presents its micros in future games, and probably how other studios decide to do it too. Don't tell Ubisoft about this. <laughs> They're already terrible. This is the last thing they need. I should make a video about Ubisoft. People like to call us paranoid, but to me it looks like every year we get just a little bit closer to when you are six hours into playing Battlefield and you run out of ammo in your clip and we ask you for a dollar to reload, you're really not very price sensitive at that point in time. And every year, people seem to keep defending greed in the gaming industry. Yeah, we're not chicken little here. Somebody with a position of authority in the gaming industry actually said this. I didn't make it up. They said it, not me. Now granted, John, uh, whatever, Rizzler, I don't know, left EA since then and went on to be the CEO of Unity, where his price gouging brought in the charging developers controversy and led him to... step down. But Johnny Boy was just one fish in the sea. And more fish means more pay to progress microtransactions to try to trick us into spending more money. You know, what's next? Who cares that they charge us to reload? You can still find ammo on the battlefield. Ugh. With some people's defenses of this kind of garbage, that really wouldn't surprise me. Look, if it feels like pay to progress is replacing play to progress, and you're worried that gaming as we know it is croaking on its deathbed, don't be discouraged. We're not powerless yet. I mean, it's our money they want, so we have all the power if you think about it. So vote with your wallets and spread the good word. If you want to see how pushing player tolerance ruined the Call of Duty series, here's a video for that right here. As always, thanks for watching. Kingered out.